Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning. Uh, we'll start with uh, questions. If you have any on last class, or any any of classes before that. For transport from NAS and acoustics, uh, there is uh, both helping trans uh, transporting information within the flow. And uh, how does they differ uh, molecular? Uh, yes. Yeah, so there are uh, this transport by diffusion, where uh, you have let's say we are thinking of transport of heat or concentration or any such quantity. So, uh, the molecular motion is random. So, if you have a molecule and if you think one dimensional just for convenience, uh, the molecule has the uh, same chance of going to the left or to the right. It can go anywhere, but then if you are talking about diffusion of heat or, or, or material, uh, on one side we have let us say a, a more number of particles than let us say the other side. So, although a particle can move left or right, there are more particles moving from left to right than right to left if there are more particles on the right side. So, because of that uh, some kind of transport happens. So, this is like a crude explanation of diffusion. Now, you can also transport properties temperature or concentration or any kind of thing by convection. That would mean that uh, although molecules are moving in random fashion on an average there is a bulk motion which is moving from one place to another place. So, simply because physically something is moving from somewhere to another it carries the properties along with it that would be like a convective transport. Now, um, <coughs> when you speak about uh, uh, waves transporting energy or momentum and so on uh, what it does is uh, you do not have to uh, physically move the particle does not have to physically move from one place to another place particles are moving, but you can actually transport the properties over much larger distances than the amount of particle displacement a particle is undergoing. This is because you can have collisional process and you have uh, one molecule hitting another molecule that hitting another one that hitting another one and this process can happen and over a very large distance you can have the uh, properties being um, propagated without really having the physical mass moving in, in, in that sense and uh, so this is another kind of transport. Now, uh, uh, this happens at the speed of sound. Uh, and if you uh, if you want to think in terms of our Euler equations and Navier-Stokes equations and so on, uh, they they represent some kind of elasticity in the medium, the Euler equations or compressibility. So because of the compressibility of the medium, it's like a spring. If you compress the spring, and if the spring is compressible, the compression or rarefaction can propagate. So <coughs> that kind of motion is supported by our uh, Euler equation. So acoustics goes along with that. Convection is also supported with that. So if you have uh, a flow going flow will transport the equation. Now, if you have navier stokes equation and you have if you have diffusion in, in them not in the Euler, but navier stokes that supports transport when there is a gradient in properties. So, those are the three different things viewed either from a uh, molecular view or uh, or a um, or from a uh, microscopic uh, navier stokes Euler equation kind of uh, framework. Does that answer your question anything else anybody else have any questions. Okay. So, in the last class we stopped by looking at the acoustic energy corollary. So, that means we uh, corollary implies the fact that we did not really uh, start from a new governing equations uh, new governing equation we actually started with the same conservation equations, but we uh, massaged them in some way that we got uh, some acoustic energy. So, we said that the rate of acoustic energy the rate of growth of acoustic energy growth or decay is equal to whatever is coming in minus whatever is coming out and whatever is coming in or going out that we said represented in terms of the acoustic intensity. So, that is where we <coughs> stop and we will continue from uh, there on today. So, we defined a quantity called acoustic intensity.
So I put this arrow over the letter i uh, because to emphasize that it is a vector SPV where v is the direction of the velocity vector. So in uh, one dimensions your i can be written as i times i where i is the unit unit vector. So, <coughs> so i is function of i of x comma t uh, in general three dimension it is a function of uh, not only uh, space but also time because it is a uh, unsteady quantity and uh, uh, general. So in 1D we can say so if we had a only travelling wave and if the travelling wave is let us say going to the right we can say it is p prime over rho c times i and so we could then say i equal to p prime squared over rho bar c times i. So that means uh, it is good intensity can be uh, uh, can be reduced from measurements of pressure. Now pressure is much cheaper to measure compared to velocity because uh, measurement of pressure involves what kind of device? No, Pitot probe will not measure these pressures. Why won't it measure? The, the frequency response of Pitot measurements is very poor. Well, what would you need to measure sound? What kind of transducers? No, that is to measure pressure. You need pressure transducers. That is like a cool statement. But <laughs> piezoelectric transducers. What else is available? Strain gauge, yeah. Those are used for uh, strain gauge for high pressure oscillations. Simple Microphone. microphones, yeah. If you are a musician and you are singing, you sing with a, uh, here there is a microphone here. So uh, I think that is, uh, uh, those are simpler compared to velocity measurements. The cheapest velocity measurements would be like a hardware uh, anemometer, which would uh, be, I mean, the microphone, a very good quality microphone would cost, I do not know, 2 lakhs or something. Uh, a cheap one from the music store will cost a few hundred rupees plus the amplifier. Uh, hardware will cost I don't know 30 lakhs or something. And then if you want to do the laser based techniques uh, <coughs> I think PIV and uh, what else is there? LDV, uh, particle image velocimetry and laser doppler velocimetry they are of the order of crores. So I think measuring pressure with a microphone or a piezoelectric transducers they are actually uh, uh, cheaper than the microphones uh, the good quality ones. So uh, that is simpler than or and cheaper than measuring velocity. So we are always trying to get techniques where we can measure pressure and estimate the velocity. So if you want to estimate the acoustic velocity we actually go for two microphone technique because why two microphone rather than measuring velocity it is very expensive to measure velocity that is the thing and in engineering we want to go as simple and as cheap as possible. So <coughs> now we uh, talked about harmonic plane waves. And so where uh, p prime of x comma t let us say was b cos kx minus omega t. So therefore what would i be? i of x comma t would be equal to a squared over rho bar c here cos squared kx minus omega t times t times i <coughs> which I guess you can recast this as a squared over 2 rho bar c into 1 plus cos 2 kx minus omega t. Now uh, in practice although uh, we can write this expressions this quantity i is actually pretty much a useless quantity because you have a quantity which is oscillating in time. Now if you look at uh, a pressure signal of this form let us say this is P versus T and this is A and if we look at I x and this would be Uh, 
so this is a quantity which is going up and down every uh, every moment and then we will have to evaluate it for each moment and then we have to figure out sometimes it is going up, sometimes it is coming down. So, this is kind of a useless quantity. What is much more useful is the time average intensity. Then we know that over a time period average, when you say time average, a natural way of averaging would be averaging over an acoustic cycle if there is a harmonic oscillation at certain frequency. So, then we can know over a cycle whether the power is coming in or going out. So, that way this time average uh, intensity is a much more useful quantity. So, So, if you say I average of x, so typically time average is denoted by triangle brackets. So, now this could be thought of as 1 over tau integral 0 to tau whatever is the quantity times dt. So, for uh, periodic waves time period uh, is a very natural quantity to average. <coughs> now, for non periodic waves it is uh, such an obvious time scale uh, does not exist. So, what you have to do is we have to average over a time period which is long enough. So, that we, we can um, include all the time scales available or that the average does not <coughs> depend on tau. So, uh, although the I with the triangle brackets is strictly speaking called the time average acoustic intensity, intensity um, in practice that is what is referred to as intensity itself. So, we drop the term time average, but when you uh, refer to usually as acoustic intensity most likely the uh, people who use those terms would be meaning a time average acoustic intensity as is being used in the engineering parlance. Uh, so, this uh, I often refer to as intensity, but this would uh, actually mean time average intensity. So, if you have a 1D wave, what would be the acoustic intensity? So, so this would be P prime squared over rho bar c because v is p prime over rho c. So, uh, this would be uh, this times i of course, because it is a vector. So, strictly speaking so th this uh, time average of p prime square would be actually p prime r m squared and there is a rho c here. So, there is this rho c here. Now, if you are talking about a harmonic wave, <coughs> we can say p r m s squared equal to 1 over t square root of 0 to t a cos squared k x minus omega t d t which could be written as a squared over t and integral 0 to t 1 minus cos 2 k x minus omega t divided by 2 d t. Now, 
what is the average of uh, I mean sorry what is the integral of cos 2 k x minus omega t over a time period tau time period t. This is a periodic function. So, if you average over a period or uh, at least period there is a 2 here. So, it is a uh, double the uh, frequency it is oscillating. So, if you average over t this term will drop it, it would average to 0 because it is periodic uh, function and only contribution will be from the first term. So, which would be t over 2. So, this would be equal to a squared over t multiplied by t over 2 which is a squared over so, P RMS would be A over So, this is a very simple result we can get for harmonic waves. I think you knew all of this from high school, but we are just uh, doing it for sake of completeness. And now, we speak about uh, another quantity uh, called acoustic power. Acoustic power is the uh, net acoustic intensity flowing through the entire surface. So, we can um, write a formal de uh, definition as follows. So, if you integrate this intensity over the entire surface which you are dealing with, then you get the acoustic power. And acoustic uh, power is a very useful quantity, because many times in propagating acoustic fields, the acoustic power will stay constant uh, at various surfaces. Just to give you example, <coughs> if you are talking about acoustic power enclosed in a let us say in a sphere or something of radius r and then the waves are propagating and let us say we are in the middle of the universe, there is no boundaries and so on. And so, uh, it is kind of intuitively obvious that 4 pi r squared times i would be a constant. So, although i is uh, intensity is flowing is going as 1 over r squared and p and v are uh, falling as 1 over r, but the power is staying constant. So, in that sense power is a very useful quantity. So, now <coughs> we talked about uh, traveling waves and then we spoke about uh, <coughs> acoustic intensity. Now, the next issue comes we are dealing with combustors and there do we have often traveling waves or standing waves. Yeah. Uh, that is standing waves are more the norm than traveling waves. Why do you have standing waves? Yeah, so if you are looking at a flame in the open middle of nowhere sound will be radiated out and very likely you can think of sound as just a radiating field. But in the combustors for example, the combustors for a gas turbine engine or solid rocket motor the sound will go to some boundary let us say choke nozzle or whatever and come back. So, th there is a uh, very good possibility that sound is reflected well reflected and come back. So, we are in a standing wave and what would be the acoustic intensity for a standing wave that is the question that I wish to address next. So, Of course, in the linear regime we can think of a standing wave as superimposition of two traveling waves one going to the left and one going to the right that is ok. But uh, if you we know that if you have a standing wave going to the right what is the velocity expression for velocity let us look at one dimensional quantity not c what is the particle velocity or the acoustic velocity no no particle velocity u what is u. How do you get velocity? We did problems in the last class. P prime by rho c, absolutely right. Yeah, uh, c is the speed of the wave. That is not the particle velocity, or the, that's not the acoustic velocity. It is the phase speed, or the speed of the wave. We are talking about particle velocity. So in this acoustic intensity, which is defined as p prime times u prime, that's actually the u prime corresponds to the acoustic velocity or the particle velocity. It's not the speed of the wave at all it is not c ok let us be very clear about it. Now, if you have a left running wave what would be the quantity 
minus. So, you, you have a right trending wave, you have to divide by rho c and left trending wave it is minus rho c. So, it is so the total velocity is not equal to pressure over rho c because pressure goes like f plus g over rho c and velocity will go like f minus c over rho c. So, there is no a, not a simple ratio. So, either you have to know how much of the uh, wave corresponding to left trending wave or right trending wave or you have to be more careful and do the analysis. So, uh, th this thing I want I wish to warn you. So, uh, often without even thinking we think that velocity goes like pressure over rho c and that is we must remember that that is only for a traveling wave which is to the left or right. To the right it is p prime over rho c, to the left it is p prime over minus rho c, but if it is a combination of left and right one has to be very careful as to uh, which way you go. So, let us uh, consider a general case where uh, you have a, st a standing wave. So, we will write a general expression for pressure and velocity and uh, so once again let me check with you about the understanding of pressure. So, if I am if I am giving you a complex acoustic amplitude what would be the uh, actual amplitude that you measure, what will be the instantaneous pressure value that I measure, how do you get that from the complex amplitude. Uh, can you speak loudly I am not able to hear anything. Huh? No, actually you have to multiply your pressure amplitude by e power i omega t and then take the real part that is what gives the instantaneous pressure. So, it is I hope uh, you review the notes from last time you have to take the multiply this complex number with another complex number here and you will have uh, uh, combinations coming from real part and imaginary part which is what results in a certain phase. So, we cannot simply take the modulus of this complex amplitude this is a common mistake that we make. So, let us uh, be very careful about this. So, if you do this calculation and take the real part, so the real uh, and then you can write p prime as cos omega t plus phi ok and I will put a subscript phi uh, because I want to keep uh, distinguish this phase with, with another phase. So, if you uh, similarly if you write u. Now, for a traveling wave this phi p and phi u will be same ok, but we are uh, if you are having only one traveling wave, but we are not really talking about one traveling wave we are looking at a, a general standing wave. So, uh, if you now take the average this would be what the acoustic intensity would be and now we can use some trigonometric identities and to make the integration possible. So, this cos omega t uh, this this product term can be written as uh, cos 2 omega t plus p p plus p u over 2 plus cos p p minus phi over 2 d t and when you integrate this over a time period I think it is you can guess what happened to this term this will drop out because you are integrating a periodic function over a period you will get net value of 0 
and this will be multiplied by uh, T over 2. So, you will get This is the uh, acoustic intensity, time average acoustic intensity for a general wave, which is uh, p prime, uh, p hat, u hat. You take the modulus, multiply them, and the phase between the pressure and velocity. I hope this is clear. Now uh, we can actually define a quantity called admittance, which is the reciprocal of impedance. We talked about impedance earlier, and what was the definition of impedance? What does impedance? Huh? P prime, yeah. So in the in the frequency domain, it's p hat by u hat. So you can similarly define admittance u hat over p hat. It's similar to conductance in electrical engineering. So, if you look at the real part of this, this is a complex quantity because it is ratio of two complex numbers. So, y real So, we see that y real is u hat over p hat times the phase between the velocity and pressure. You can write phi u minus phi p or phi p minus phi u, it does not matter, you will get the same result. And so, we can then write the intensity which we got here in terms of this, uh, this uh, admittance. So, I is really y real into so the intensity is uh, real part of admittance multiplied by uh, r must value of the pressure so uh, <coughs> now we can actually uh, have a non dimensional admittance y this is which is equal to y real over 1 over rho bar c. So, then uh, uh, the units are matching. So, this will actually be equal to y, you can show this is equal to So, if you have intensity of a general standing wave and if you were having at the same pressure amplitude a corresponding traveling wave, this uh, ratio between them that would give actually the non dimensional admittance. I hope this is uh, clear physically, I mean, or, or the meaning of that. Sir, yeah. suppose we have a uh, source, yeah. uh, two which are giving uh, signals which are not uh, uh, trigonometric functions because we give. Uh, to a speaker, yeah. square or triangular functions. Yeah, so we then the sound propagated will 
will it adjust itself to be a well you can give any amount of signal you want and you can uh, uh, still do fourier transform and uh, split it into harmonic and then use this analysis so if you that's if you want to do it in the frequency domain you are also welcome to work in the time domain uh, only thing is things will be simpler in the uh, frequency domain but if you have transient signals then time domain is what one should work on but if you are uh, not really having transient phenomena then harmonic domain is convenient and uh, it's much simpler so in in summary for a traveling wave um, i will be p r m s squared over rho c right we saw that and for a general uh, wave it will be p r m s squared times y real that we saw so this is y real times p r m s squared and we know that i traveling wave equal to uh, p r m s squared by rho c. So, if you take the ratio of this i over i traveling wave you will actually get y divided by 1 over rho c which is like a non-dimensional admittance. So, this is like a uh, reference value 1 over rho c is a ref reference value then a traveling wave um, that is the maximum intensity that you can get through because the pressure and velocity are in phase. You can have situations in standing wave where they are out of phase then no intensity flows or no in, in or out. So, are there any questions? Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. Yes. And we will work out that for a general case now. We will solve the problem for uh, with the kx term. So, we did some examples earlier where we looked at uh, nice standing waves and ducts which are open at both ends or uh, closed at both ends, both ends one side open one side closed. And in all the cases we got the in the solution we got either a equal to b or, or we, we had a e power i k x and b e power minus i k x those were the left and right turning waves. And then we had uh, either a equal to b or a equal to minus b. Now, what if a is not equal to b and I think uh, what are the general features of the standing wave and uh, so in, in, in the way the acoustic problem is posed you actually have a wave equation which is the differential equation which is governing your phenomena and then what do we need and in the harmonic domain we have taken the time dependence out and then what do you need to solve this equation. boundary conditions. So, so, how do we know the boundary condition? I mean in the earlier case the problems we worked out what did we do? We considered some problems where the uh, tube is closed or open and so on, but in reality it may not be uh, anything of that sort. It may be neither closed nor open and I said it is of the order of it is like a mixed boundary condition a times p plus b times u equal to 0 that kind of that is the admittance or impedance boundary condition. Now, in if you are given a tube and there is a boundary, do we know the boundary condition? Now, we know that in classroom problems when we study differential equations and so on, the professor gives you a, a differential equation and gives you the boundary condition and a, they solve, solve the differential equation. Is this, but in reality it does not work this way. We can know the differential equation that is fine somebody has derived it. We can also know the solution because you can have microphones mounted on a transducer or you can traverse a microphone in a duct or, or, or microphones mounted on the tube and you can actually measure the pressure. So, there is nothing big deal about there is no big deal about knowing the solution because we can measure it even if you are an idiot and we cannot solve the differential equation we can actually measure it. But can we know the boundary condition? No actually that is the answer. <coughs> You can have the equation, we can have a solution, but there is no way to know if I give you a given material um, like this cloth or a reflecting liner or, or, or some kind of um, this kind of uh, material which is uh, used in a studio. I mean by looking at it you cannot know the um, um, impedance or admittance of those quantities. So, it is hard to know the boundary, in, in reality we do not know the boundary condition, but it is 
interesting that we actually know the solution. This was very striking to me when I made this realization first that I know the solution, but I do not know the boundary condition. So, in reality what is the problem? It is really inverse problem that is we know the differential equation because it is derived and it is peaceful. We know the solution can we determine the boundary condition that is the actual problem. I mean textbook problem may be different. Now, why do you need to do this? That is you measure the solution from there we determine the boundary condition. What is the advantage of doing this? Yeah, so that if you have so once you know the boundary condition, uh, then for any other situation, you can predict the acoustic field in duct if you for, for given this boundary. Uh, so uh, just uh, for for example, if you are looking at a absorbing material like this uh, uh, this uh, screens here, which actually absorb uh, sound, or we can have carpet or there are absorbing liners and so on. Or uh, so, a incident wave comes there; it may not get reflected and comes back. So you have to minimize the echoes. You can also have in afterburners, for example, they use liners in the duct uh, uh, in, in the in the tube, so that there's a lot of sound, but the liner absorbs a lot of sound. <coughs> if you have a flame, for example, a wave may hit the flame, and the flame may absorb some amount of the incident wave, and a part of it may get reflected. Or if things are not going very well the incident may, wave may come here, flame may amplify the wave and a bigger devil comes out of it, a bigger a wave of bigger amplitude comes out of it. So, give, so it is important, so, so in the linear theory this admittance can characterize what a boundary does to your acoustic field. Uh, and if you know the equation and the boundary condition then we can predict the thing in, in a general sense, but off hand you do not know the boundary condition, boundary condition has to be characterized and the best way is to measure the solution and solve the inverse problem and find out what boundary condition would give the solution. So, uh, it is like uh, uh, you have to guess what would be the boundary condition which should give a certain solution it comes to that. So, that is the in, in as an experimentalist this is my real problem and, and as a uh, student of differential equation my problem was different I knew the equation and then I solved for it uh, with, with the known boundary condition, but the not yeah. Uh, so, I, I think you can uh, given the given a tube and given whatever medium is there you, and you put in the acoustic field and you can find out how the boundary behaves that means there is like a uh, you can measure the admittance or the impedance. Now, that thing if you want to express as properties of certain things uh, for example, you have, uh, uh, you have a certain type of material and you want to um, characterize the uh, uh, the admittance in terms of the pore size there or, or void fraction there and so on, then you have to characterize that boundary condition reflectivity or the admittance in terms of the further the properties of the material. But from a acoustic point of view or from a duct acoustic point of view I have a duct there is a boundary and I want to characterize the boundary. So, uh, for that the simplest way is to send a wave get it reflected and see how the reflection is. If, if the wave does not get reflected at all what does it? It is a travelling wave. So, it, there was nothing in the boundary it was just characteristic impedance and it is an infinitely long duct and the wave continued to go. If it got reflected back with equal amplitude it must be either a closed end or, or a open end and from the phase we can determine whether it is a closed end or a open end depending on whether the velocities are cancelling out there or whether the pressure is cancelling out. If it is anything else we have to examine carefully, but the crux of the matter is we send in a wave get it reflected find the ratio between the reflected wave and the uh, incident wave and that is the crux of the matter. Now, <coughs> of course, before solving the in inverse problem it is uh, and uh, uh, it, it is important that we solve the forward problem and then understand the features of the forward problem and then it is easy to uh, do the inverse problem because if you do not know how to do the forward problem it will be very hard to solve the inverse problem. And now, why should you characterize the in, in impedance from a uh, I mean you said why should you or what kind of parameter should be used, but there is something more fundamental that uh, about why one should characterize the uh, boundary condition because yeah you had a question. Since we already are doing the experiment and we are finding the solution by means of measurement. Yeah. So, can we just uh, do the same thing with the boundary conditions say with respect to all these parameters. 
Yeah, so if you know how to do it, so only way I know is to send an incident wave, get it reflected. So as long as you can. Yeah, so you have to measure, once you measure the pressure, you can get the boundary condition, that is all. But now, it, if it is a function of parameters, you can express the parametric dependence. Okay, but even more fundamentally, why should you know the uh, impedance? Uh, from a uh, thermoacoustic point of view, or a, a, so let us say if we remember our acoustic energy corollary that if more energy is coming in than uh, what is going out, what happens? The uh, energy in the field grows, and if more is going out and less is coming in, then you are having a kind of decay. So, if we know the intensity, that can be related to the growth or decay of the system. If you, uh, we, isn't it? And the, uh, so, if you have uh, uh, something at the boundary which is driving the flow field, I mean, driving the acoustic field inside, and then uh, what happens if it's a linear system? We'll have exponential growth. If it is driving and if it's damping, there'll be exponential decay. So, in fact, that growth or decay can actually be related to the intensity at the boundary, which can then be characterized based on the boundary condition. So that is the crux of the matter. Yeah. Uh, we did a problem before on solid rocket motor. Yeah. Then we considered close close boundary condition. Yeah. Is it because at the nozzle the flow gets choked and that is why the… Well, I uh, made a very simplistic approximation. So it is quite close to a close close boundary condition. The choked nozzle reflects most of it. In reality, some amount of acoustic waves are uh, going out and there are a lot of people who have characterized the uh, amount of uh, phase that um, amount of power that is lost in terms of um, admittance values of the nozzles and so on. In fact, there are some formulas, simple formulas available for short nozzles and, and, and so on. So, uh, what I did was a very simple approximation to get a problem done, but uh, in real, I mean you can have a more complex answer which will account for the nozzle actually takes out the acoustic energy. So, in, in rocket motors there are several um, factors involved. For example, the propellant grain can give in energy or take out energy, often it gives in energy and the nozzle is a sink, it takes out energy. So, it is a balance between these things. So, it, when you study solid rocket instability, you actually characterize the nozzle admittance accurately. Any other question? So, uh, we study some uh, experimental device called impedance tube and this technique is called impedance tube technique and it is quite simple. And I can also tell you ways to complicate it and make it really difficult. So, impedance tube is nothing but a simple tube, there is nothing fancy about it. So, if somebody says I am making an impedance tube, he is just taking a piece of pipe and calling it impedance tube, there is nothing more than that. And so, we need a, a sound source, let us say this is a external source and you have the material which you want to characterize. So, let me get a color chalk here. So, this would be the acoustic termination and we put this against a rigid backing, rigid termination. I mean this is to make sure that Okay, everything goes into this and not anywhere else. So, this is the boundary and there is a source from which sound comes and you have a microphone let us say. So, it can be a condenser microphone or you can use a piece of electric transducer and so on. And uh, now, I have to tell you some stories about uh, how to make the measurements. So, if you do have a hot wear anemometer here or fancy laser technique and people do it sometimes, you can measure the uh, velocity and the pressure and then u hat by p hat and you can get the admittance that is peaceful and if you have all those things you can do that. But otherwise 
we will use only pressure measurements. So, if you have a microphone how would you convert that into how, how would you read out the uh, value of pressure how would you get it. So, the microphone converts the acoustic pressure into into electrical signal. So, eventually you get a voltage signal whether it is a condenser microphone or a uh, pressure transducer or, or I mean a piezoelectric transducer. So, uh, the, the, so, you have a voltage signal and how would you read it? So, we can use a simple volt meter and measure uh, measure the signal uh, if that is all you have, but then you get only the amplitudes we do not get the uh, uh, get the phase if you are measuring. Uh, at different locations simultaneously. So, one possibility is you to know the phase of the standing wave you have to have a uh, reference microphone. Alternately if you are having lot of microphones you do not have to traverse the microphone you can mount all the microphone several of them in the walls. Of course, that means you have to have more money to buy more microphones. Now, uh, and sometimes it is absolutely mandatory. For example, if you are measuring the admittance of a uh, solid rocket motor uh, in a solid rocket motor kind of situation where you are looking at the response of a propellant or something and the whole propellant will be finish in something like 1 second or, or half a second or 0 0.2 seconds or something. <coughs> so, there is no way you do not have time to traverse the uh, microphone through the duct, but if you are looking at measuring the acoustic admittance of a carpet you can mount the carpet turn on put a speaker there turn on the speaker and there is no I mean it is cheaper to move the uh, microphone back and forth rather than do the uh, experiment with 20 microphones and so on. So, it, it, it just depends on the uh, circumstance that you are uh, 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 working under. Now, uh, earlier so, so one thing is to use a volt meter then you can get the amplitude I think it is uh, that is the simplest thing. If you want anything more than that you could connect two of them. Uh, the reference transducer and this transducer to a oscilloscope and you can read out the phase out of the oscilloscope or you can use a fancy data acquisition system. So, data acquisition systems are now really easily available and uh, they can the very nice programs to deal with them for example, like <coughs> lab view and, and, and so on so forth, but when I was doing experiments in several 30 years or uh, 20 years back or something like that, more than 25 years back. Uh, the uh, I mean the data systems were very crude. So, you would have a uh, uh, the programs will be on a paper tape and you have to wind the paper tape and that <coughs> itself was a uh, big job uh, and then uh, the computers in those days had uh, you know uh, hard disk size of 20 MB or 40 MB and all that which was considered big in those days and now you know you have uh, computer hard disks of the order of I do not know uh, several uh, GB <coughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so, in those days that, uh, uh, but even in 80s and so on people did uh, work with the A to D card I mean uh, it with this kind of digital data acquisition systems and before that in the 70s and 60s they used actually tape recorder. You would just like you would record uh, music on a tape recorder you would record this sound from this uh, microphones on a tape recorder and then try to extract all these values out of it. So, and then people did spectacular work in the 60s and 70s and 80s. In fact, some of the people I spoke to who are doing uh, uh, experiments with solid rocket motors now with all this fancy modern instrumentation and they have not gotten any uh, anything better than what people got in the 70s and 60s and 80s and so on. Because I guess in those days when uh, things were very difficult uh, people use their brain uh, so that you would understand things and so on. Now, we just do things <laughs> without thinking. So, uh, so you can uh, I, I just told this thing so that nowadays we do not appreciate the level of improvement that has happened to data acquisition system and we take lot of things for uh, granted, uh, but I mean it is really a, a lot of technology has evolved over a uh, long period to get uh, a lot of improvement. So, what we do now is to <coughs> measure the acoustic field includes amplitude and phase at different locations using this microphone and then we will try to see how that can be used to determine this uh, uh, reflection or the end condition here uh, in terms of the what happens to incident wave and how it gets reflected and so on. So, basically we have a, we, we cannot measure traveling waves because you have left turning wave right turning wave together that is our way of seeing things, but we will measure the pressure at several locations and then we will see if we can try to decompose it into a left turning wave and a right turning wave and then we can see how the left turning <coughs> wave gets reflected as right turning wave. 
So, I will do that uh, tomorrow and we will we'll stop here. So, in summary we looked at uh, the definition of acoustic uh, admittance and, and, and what is the physical meaning of it and now next class we will try to uh, find a way to measure it. Okay. Thank you.